Alright, so today's lecture is going to be over colon disorders, and because the colon is so big, or at least the section is, I have to divide the topics into two parts because it's just too much to cover in one lecture. So this is part one, and in part one we're going to be covering diverticular disease, IBS, and ischemic bowel disease. Here are your instructional objectives to help you, help guide you through this lecture. And again, here's kind of a topic outline, what we're going to be covering. Uh, like I said, this lecture is going to be covering diverticulosis and diverticulitis, uh, irritable bowel disease, and ischemic bowel disease. And in part two, we'll be covering these other topics. So let's jump right in. First, we're going to talk about diverticular disease. And back when I was in PA school, uh, one of my professors once said there are many different types of ticks. Itchy ticks loud ticks, blue ticks, lunatics, <laughs> but today the topic is diverticks, diverticulitis, diverticulosis. So starting off, so just to make sure we don't get confused with the terminology, the umbrella term is going to be diverticular disease. Now a diverticulum is an outpouching, an abnormal sac or pouch protruding from the wall of a hollow organ, and in this case uh, we're talking mostly about the colon, large intestine. So you'll have uh, an outpouching or ballooning of the little sac. It's really common to have diverticulum. Now diverticulosis is the presence of diverticulum or diverticula, the plural version. So diverticulosis means you have diverticula. Okay, And diverticulitis is diverticulosis plus inflammation or infection. Okay, so that's the itis part of diverticulitis. Here's another image of diverticula. You can see that when these uh, little pouches pop out, that things can become lodged inside of them. They can become blocked with feces and other things, and that can cause problems for the body. So speaking in general about diverticular disease, Colonic diverticulosis increases with age, and there's about a 5% prevalence under 40, up to over 50% by the age of 60 in Western society. So you can see that the older we get, the more likely we are to have diverticular disease. Males equal to females, so everybody's got the same shot of getting it. Uh, again, the incidence is going to decrease dramatically from age 50 to 80 years old, and Diverticula can be, it can vary. It can be a little tiny, a little diverticula all the way up to several centimeters big. And patients can have anywhere from one to dozens of these little outpouchings. And this is a, a nice picture here of multiple diverticulae all over the colon. And uh, I'm sure when we start looking at clients in the anatomy lab, we'll be able to find some patients with diverticular disease. Almost all patients with diverticulosis have involvement at the sigmoid and descending colon. That is the most common area to have it. Uh, only about 15% will have it in the proximal colon. So the most, most common is going to be sigmoid colon, descending colon. And we'll go into a little bit about why this is on the next slide. The vast majority of patients that have diverticular, di diverticular disease do not know that they even have it. Uh, more than likely, at least one of us has it, and we don't know that we have it. And there is a higher incidence in Western country, and we relate it mostly to a low-fiber, high-fat diet. And we'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide. So general characteristics, like we said, more, much more common in the descending and sigmoid colon. It's caused by increased intraluminal pressure. And I like to think of blowing a balloon so I don't know how many of you have ever tried to blow up a balloon by by mouth. It takes pressure, you kind of blow, 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 and all of a sudden, whoop, it pops out. And that's kind of what happens along the colon. So that pressure uh, from pushing due to a low-fiber, high-fat diet that we have in the Western society. And um, like we said, increasing fiber is a good thing. Constipation causes you to strain more when you have to defecate, and that causes, uh, you know, pushing, causes this, uh, these diverticulae to pop out. 
Um, also, positive family history increases the prevalence. And, of course, again, prevalence increases with age. And we mentioned that sanguine colon is the most common area to have it. Now, as I was researching for this topic, I read that recent epidemiologic studies challenge the theory of the, the constipation that causes it. Uh, they did not find a prevalence of asymptomatic diverticulosis in a low dietary fiber intake or constipation. So I guess we could say that although we have theories about the etiology of diverticulosis, the true etiology is still uh, questionable. So how do these patients present? Well, in diverticulosis, remember that's the presence of diverticula, uh, more than 90% of patients have uncomplicated disease and no specific symptoms. They essentially don't really know that they have it. And to be truthful, most diverticulosis is actually found incidentally, meaning we're not really looking for it, but we find it, we're like, oh, there's some diverticula, right? So we see this most often on routine screening colonoscopies for colon cancer, and um, barium enemas for whatever reason they need to be done. Uh, patients, if they do have symptoms, this is diverticulosis we're talking about, they might have a little bit of kind of vague left lower quadrant discomfort, not pain, just a little discomfort. Sometimes they can have bloating, chronic constipation, or even fluctuating bowel habits where they kind of go from loose to hard stools. And uh, only about 10 to 20% become symptomatic and then develop complications such as bleeding or diverticulitis. So that's good to know. As common as it is, uh, only 10 to 20% are going to become complicated, right? So there, as far as diverticulosis is concerned, unless you have bleeding or diverticulitis, if you have asymptomatic disease, there is no reason to perform imaging studies just to look for look for diverticulosis, right? Uh, like I said, we find it mostly incidentally, barium enemas, colonoscopies, even CTs, but we don't go looking for it unless we think it's causing a problem, right? Um, so treatment for diverticulosis is going to be high fiber foods, so bran, um, increasing the stool bulk and making it pass easier. Also fiber supplementation like psyllium based, um, flaxseed powder, methyl cellulose, so like your, um, your over the counter fibers, right? And then they also, there are some studies out there that show that the risk of diverticulitis can be reduced with regular exercise and avoiding red meats and NSAIDs. Although I, I don't know if it's, it's not as commonly known to do that, but we could definitely recommend it. It wouldn't hurt anything. And as far as surgery, so diverticulosis can cause bleeding and it can also cause recurrent diverticulitis. So in extreme cases, when you have massive hemorrhages, when you're ruling out carcinomas or if you're treating those complications, surgery can be performed where you remove that section of colon that has those diverticula present. So it is an option, but it's not done commonly. Complications. So we just talked about things getting complicated, right? So we said it occurs in less than 5%, including gastrointestinal bleeding and diverticulitis. So it doesn't happen very often, but painless rectal bleeding, uh, half of all of the cases of lower GI bleeding, acute lower GI bleeding, are attributed to diverticulosis. So it is a major player in lower GI bleeds. We have to consider it as a diagnosis when we have lower GI bleeding. Uh, the bleeding is usually clinically insignificant, so just a little bit of blood kind of on the stool or in the water. And in these cases, it's, um, it's unnecessary to treat the patient, but it can be severe, very severe, where patients actually uh, have the bleeding and it doesn't stop and they become hemodynamically unstable because of it. So in those cases, of course, we have to act more aggressively. But in many cases, the bleeding stops spontaneously. Colonoscopy can be performed to try to find the site of the bleeding. Uh, and if it's persistent or you know we can't get it under control, then surgery might be needed. Um, and then another complication, a big complication of diverticulosis is going to be diverticulitis. And for this presentation, 
As far as the lower GI bleeding caused by diverticulosis, we will cover that more in depth in our GI bleed lecture, but I do want to mention that it is a major player in lower GI bleeds, especially in the elderly population. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about diverticulitis. So diverticulitis is the presence of diverticula, so diverticulosis, plus uh, an infection, right? So it occurs when something becomes impacted in the diverticulum leading to erosion and microperforation. Now, back in the day, um, even back when I was in PA school, the recommendation was that patients with diverticulosis didn't eat anything that could potentially get stuck in the diverticula. So thinking like seeds and nuts and things like that. Uh, but I know as, as far as the research I've done, it has not been proven that those are, uh, those increase the risk of diverticulitis anything more than regular food that, that's eaten, right? So you can choose to recommend that to your patient or not. Um, so in uncomplicated diverticulitis, so in cases that are in patients with no comorbidities, uh, pretty straightforward, um, these are the most amount of cases are mostly uncomplicated, but it refers um, to, you know, a pretty easy course, right? And some some uncomplicated cases can be treated outpatient, and then depending on the symptomatology and the patient's um, comorbidities, can treat inpatient. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Complicated diverticulitis is diverticulitis that's complicated by something else on top of it. So abscesses are pretty common with diverticulosis, I mean, excuse me, diverticulitis. Uh, the infection can actually wall off another infection around it. And it, depending on the, the, the size of the abscess, it can either be drained percutaneously, so through the skin by CT guidance, or it can be surgically removed. Uh, very small abscesses can also be treated just uh, systemically with antibiotics. Other things that can happen, because you got these little pouches, the wall is pretty thin, the wall of the colon in those pouches can actually rupture and form what's called a fistula. So a fistula connects one part of the body to the other that are not supposed to be connected together. And the most common site of fistulization in the, in the abdomen from diverticulitis is going to be um, from the bladder to the colon. And... Um, some of these close spontaneous, some of these need to be addressed surgically. Other things that can happen, you can get an obstruction from the chronic inflammation, thickening of the bowel, and free colonic perforation, which is not good when you have stool that is leaking into the uh, peritoneum, into the abdominal cavity. It can be really bad if this happens. It leads to peritonitis, sepsis, and even death. So here's an illustration of what could happen with those diverticula. Um, here's the, the regular old diverticula, here's a ruptured diverticulum, and there's a depiction of this on a surgical specimen, and then here's the fistulization. So the hallmark signs and symptoms of diverticulitis, the clinical features are going to be, the typical presentation is three things, fever, left lower quadrant abdominal pain, and leukocytosis. Usually those three are present together. Now it doesn't mean that if the patient doesn't have any of those three symptoms or doesn't have one of those three symptoms that they don't have diverticulitis, but common things are common and this is a typical presentation. Other, um, other features that come along with diverticulitis are alterations of bowel habits. So usually they go from like being constipated to having loose stools and constipated and loose stools kind of back and forth. Uh, it can also just be one or the other, depending um, on the patient. Uh, nausea and vomiting are usually present. Uh, sometimes you can even feel a painful mass on examination uh, uh, if, you, if you can palpate it. Uh, you can have stool occult blood, but usually the frank blood, like hematochesia, is rare. Now, patients with free perforation are going to have way more dramatic picture, right? They're going to have generalized abdominal pain, peritoneal signs, rebound tenderness, fever, high fever, uh, and they're going to look much more ill. So diagnostic tests. The test of choice for diverticulitis is a CT scan, and it's a CT of the abdomen and pelvis with oral and IV contrast. That is the test of choice. 
It'll help you localize if there is a uh, diverticula, and it'll also help you determine if there's um, abscesses or perforations or any of that thing. Um, abdominal radiographs, they help in excluding other things. A lot of times, kind of the protocol in most emergency rooms is you see the patient, you order uh, lab work, and you start giving them medication and get a plain film and then get the CT because it kind of goes in that, that pattern. Uh, you don't always have to get an abdominal radiograph, but a lot of times they are a lot faster in the emergency room to get a, an x-ray versus a CT scan, especially with a patient that's having to drink oral contrast. So with oral contrast, the patient usually drinks it and then has to wait about two hours for that contrast to kind of make its way through the, the colon to make its way through the bowel. So you, as you can imagine, you know, if there's a perforation or anything like that that we would like to see it before that two hours come up so um, that's why we tend to get the abdominal radiographs are just a little faster can also rule out other things like obstructions and such so patients that respond to acute medical management should undergo complete colonic evaluation with colonoscopy so if patients have diverticulitis and you treat them with oral antibiotics they should undergo a colonoscopy or other radiologic imaging like a CT colon colonography in four to eight weeks afterwards that's to look for things like cancer and other things that you can't see on a CT a plain CT so that's in any type of in any patient that has these diverticula after the fact um, barium enema and colonoscopy are contraindicated in acute diverticulitis. They love to test about this, so please, please, please make sure that you know it, okay? Barium enema and colonoscopy are contraindicated, and that is because there is a risk of perforation. If you're sticking a camera into the colon where you have this inflammation, the wall's already thin and it's inflamed, uh, you have an increased risk of perforating that area. So treatment, uncomplicated disease. Most patients with uncomplicated disease can be managed with conservative measures. So you definitely wanna treat on a case-by-case -case basis. Patients with mild symptoms, no peritoneal signs, no comorbidities can be treated outpatient. They'll be placed on a clear liquid diet for two to three days and a broad spectrum antibiotic. Um, Reasonable regimens include amoxicillin, or augmentin, excuse me, uh, metronidazole, uh, and plus either Cipro or Bactrim. And the patient remains on these for seven to 10 days or until the patient is afebrile for three to five days. This is the outpatient treatment. Symptomatic improvement usually occurs within three days at which time the diet can be advanced, right, from clear liquids up. And once, so, Remember we said that patients with diverticulosis should be recommended a high fiber diet. Now, these patients, if they develop diverticulitis, you, d you want to discontinue the high fiber diet during the bout of diverticulitis. You wanna discontinue that. Uh, after the, the episode has resolved, then you can recommend they, they resume the high fiber diet. Now, complicated disease, patients that that have comorbidities, they have increased pain, fever, inability to tolerate liquids, they need to be hospitalized. And hospitaliz hospitalization is also required in patients that are immunocompromised, have comorbid conditions, abscesses, or signs of severe diverticulitis, including fevers, leukocytosis, peritoneal signs. These patients need to be admitted to the hospital. If you have a question about whether or not a patient should be sent home, probably need to admit them. There are other things, of course, socioeconomic things and uh, patient reliability issues that come into play where you're not sure whether they can be um, counted on to take their medications as directed at home, or maybe they can't care for themselves. Those are other reasons why you'd want to keep them in the hospital. If in doubt, hospitalize them. And their hospitalization course is going to include um, making them NPO, so no, fl no fluids, no food by mouth and IV fluids to maintain their hydration status. Uh, some patients get an NG tube, especially if there's an ileus present. 
Um, and patients get placed on IV antibiotics. It's going to cover anaerob anaerobes and gram-negative bacteria. Uh, there's several different combinations of antibiotics that can be used, including single-agent therapy or combination therapy. Most of the time, a hospital has kind of their protocols that they have and their formularies, and you'll get to know your hospital's um, plans for di treating diverticulitis. Um, like we said, symptomatic improvement should be seen within two to three days. And the IV antibiotics should be continued for five to seven days before switching to oral antibiotics. So the hospital stays for this are, are rather long. Now, surgical management. There are indications for surgical consultation. Um, patients with severe disease that do not improve after 72 hours of medical management uh, warrant repeat abdominal CT imaging uh, and a surgical consultation to see if there's an abscess that's forming or something that is preventing this patient from improvement. Now, the magic number for abscesses is, is four centimeters. So usually uh, an abscess of four centimeters or bigger requires percutaneous catheter drainage. So that, that means that we go through the skin with a, you know, with a needle and we drain that abscess. Uh, the thing about abscesses is that they tend to kind of wall themselves off from the rest of the body, and so it makes it really difficult for antibiotics to penetrate and treat those infections, and so that's why we have to drain them. Um, indications for emergent surgical management include generalized peritonitis. Now, those with diverticulitis um, that, that uncomplicated, they should not have frank peritoneal signs. They shouldn't have super high fever. Uh, they shouldn't look toxic, have high lactic acid levels. If we're concerned about that, we're concerned that there could be uh, a large and drainable abscess or perforation, and those are indications for emergent surgical management. Um, if in doubt, get this, uh, consult the surgeon sooner rather than later. After, after patients recover uh, from complicated diverticulitis, uh, then sometimes surgical resection is recommended to reduce recurrent episodes of complicated disease. Now that is on a case-by-case -case basis. Any patients that have you know, disease resulting in fistulas, clonic obstruction will require elective surgical resection, so removing those sections of bowel that have all the diverticula. Now the prognosis. So diverticulitis recurs in about 15-20% to 20 of patients. However, less than 5% have more than two recurrences, so that's good to know. Um, among the patients that have episodes of uncomplicated diverticulitis, less than 5% later develop complicated disease, so that is good to know as well. Uh, good to know that if you have uncomplicated diverticulitis, that more than likely if you have it again, which about 15-20% of you will have it again, it will not be uh, complicated, or it shouldn't be. Uh, back in the day, they used to recommend, the kind of blanket recommend this elective surgical resection, but it's not routinely recommended anymore. And there is no associated increased risk of colon cancer with diverticulitis. Here's some kind of pearls as to when to refer a patient. So if you are the practitioner at a clinic or urgent care, this, these are the reasons why you'd want to refer patients and when you when you need to admit patients and like we mentioned i have low threshold for admitting patients with diverticulitis um, so here are those indications similar to what we've already discussed so that is the end of our diverticulitis losis talk we are now going to move into irritable bowel syndrome or otherwise known as ibs and at this moment, I first order of business, I want to remind you that irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, is not inflammatory bowel disease, IBD. They are different. So make sure in your brain you do not get these two mixed up because although they both cause abdominal pain and diarrhea and such, they are two completely different um, disease processes and I want you to remember that. Don't get them confused. We will talk about IBD next time in our lecture. So IBS, 
IBS is very common. I wouldn't doubt that you've heard of someone that has it or have a friend that has it or maybe you have it or you've heard of it on the news. It's a very common functional gastrointestinal disorder. So it is characterized by combination of chronic recurrent GI symptoms that are not explicable in the presence of structural or biochemical abnormalities. So what does that mean in English? What it means is that these patients have recurrent GI symptoms, including abdominal pain and alteration of bowels that are not explained by something else. Meaning you do all these tests, do colonoscopies and other things, and you cannot find an organic cause for their problems. IBS is an idiopathic clinical entity, chronic, more than three months, abdominal pain that it occurs in association with altered bowel habits. And the symptoms can be continuous or intermittent. There are some criteria that we will talk about as to how, how and when to formally diagnose patients with IBS. It is a diagnosis of exclusion, and there are criteria that patients have to meet to be diagnosed with IBS. Um, it's actually a really underdiagnosed problem. Uh, up to 10% of patients have symptoms compatible with the diagnosis, and approximately 40% of individuals who meet diagnostic criteria for IBS do not have a formal diagnosis. So there's a chance that maybe even some of us don't have a formal diagnosis of IBS, but actually meet criteria for it. Um, there's about 10 to 15% prevalence in North America of IBS. It's pretty prevalent. Now, females are two-thirds more likely than males to have IBS. Uh, so two-thirds of the patient have that have IBS are female. And we tend to see the onset in young adulthood, usually late teens to early 20s. Now, there is a loose association of IBS with other conditions, including things like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, uh, GERD, and some other psychiatric disorders like major depression, anxiety, and somatization. Uh, so they are loosely um, connected. So again, how does yeah, IBS present clinically? First of all, chronic abdominal pain and altered bowel habits. Now, in 2016, the Rome criteria, Rome 4 criteria, uh, was established, and the definition of IBS is abdominal pain that has two of the three following features. So it has to have two out of three. It has to be related to defecation, meaning that the pain is associated with going to the bathroom, having a bowel movement. Uh, it has to be associated with a change in the frequency of stool, so frequency, or the, the change in form or appearance of stool. Okay, so it has to have two out of the three of those. And the symptoms of abdominal pain should be present on average at least one day per week. Other symptoms supporting the diagnosis are going to be abnormal stool frequency, abnormal stool form, stool passage, uh, so straining, the, the sensation of incomplete evacuation, abdominal bloating, a feeling of abdominal distension. You can see that the symptoms are all over the place for IBS. And not all patients experience all these symptoms. Some only experience a few and others other symptoms. Um, so it can be uh, challenging to diagnose and not all patients go in because of it. They usually describe the pain, the chronic abdominal pain is like this cramping sensation and it can vary in intensity and ha they usually have kind of periodic exacerbations. And amongst all of the patients of IBS, the location and character of the pain can vary a lot from patient to patient. Patients also can have abdominal pain that is affected by emotional stress or meals. They also report abdominal bloating and gas, such as flatulence or belching. It's a very flattering disease. Uh, now, as far as the altered bowel habits, it can be diarrhea-based, meaning they have this abdominal pain and diarrhea. They can have abdominal pain and constipation, uh, or they can have a combination of the two, um, alternating between normal diarrhea and constipation. Now, those that present with diarrhea, the diarrhea is usually frequent loose stools, you know, small to moderate volume, uh, 
uh, during the waking hours. If the patient has to wake up in the middle of the night to have a diarrhea bowel movement, it is not likely IBS. Um, they usually kind of have this sensation of urgency, kind of this, I got to rush to the bathroom. And after they go, they, they also tend to have this sensation of incomplete evacuation. Like they still have to go even after they're done. Uh, patients can have some mucus discharge with stools. However, large volume diarrhea, bloody stools, nocturnal or greasy stools are not IBS. They're not IBS. Um, constipation based IBS stools are usually hard pellet shaped tenesmus so the tenesmus is kind of the the colon's version of dry heaves they just have that feeling like gotta squeeze but then nothing comes out kind of thing um, the patient should be of IBS so we know that IBS is a diagnosis of exclusion it's very common but we, we certainly don't want to miss an organic cause like a cancer or uh, something else, right? Inflammatory bowel disease. So patients should always be asked about alarm symptoms, something that suggests something other than IBS that warrants further investigation. So if patients' symptoms ar arise, you know, older than 40 to 50 years old, it's not as likely to be IBS so those are some reasons why you'd want to kind of look a little bit more into it. Again, nocturnal diarrhea, severe constipation or diarrhea, blood, bloody stools, weight loss, fever, those, those should be uh, further investigated for underlying disease. And then patients that have family history of cancer, IBD, or celiac disease, they should have more of an evaluation. On physical exam, you're really looking for for evidence of organic disease and you kind of you have to do a thorough physical exam because you want to you know soothe or uh, kind of put down any anxiety that the patient has physical exam is usually normal you might have a little bit of kind of vague abdominal tenderness but it shouldn't be pronounced here's that Rome 4 criteria and I like it because it's in a nice little chart we have recurrent abdominal pain at least one day per week in the last three months associated with at least two of the following. Related to defecation, associated with change in stool frequency or form. All right, and this criteria should be fulfilled for the last three months with symptom onset over six months prior to diagnosis. So all this needs to happen for you to be able to call your patient uh, having IBS. And they have to have you know, no other alarm signs or symptoms and no other organic cause for their problem. Now, we just talked about stool form and frequency, right? So we're going to have to ask a lot of patients questions, very personal questions about how often they're having bowel movements and what their bowel movements look like. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm pretty self-aware. I know what's going on when I have bowel movements. Now, not all patients are that self-aware. They don't always kind of look and see what's going on after they uh, leave a deposit. So we use tools like the Bristol stool uh, chart to help patients kind of say, well, it looks like this or this or this. And that helps, uh, you know, differentiate the subtypes of IBS. Now, remember we mentioned that there's a predominantly constipation based, which is IBS-C. We also have diarrhea predominant, which is IBS-D, and we have a mixed bowel, which is kind of an alteration of constipation and diarrhea, and that's IBS-M. So there is no definitive diagnostic laboratory test for IBS. You know, you can't just get a, uh, let me see, a H. pylori test, right? This is like, bam, I got the diagnosis. There is nothing that diagnoses IBS. So the purpose of laboratory testing is mainly to, to rule out other alternative diagnoses. Uh, all patients that are age appropriate should have colorectal screening. Uh, and patients with constipation, you plus or minus abdominal radiograph to look for stool accumulation. Additional testing should always be done in patients with those alarm symptoms. And patients that meet diagnostic criteria for IBS and have no alarm features, there's really no routine testing beyond the initial evaluation. It has been shown though uh, that visits 
follow-up visits with the with the primary care or excuse me the gastroenterology provider for those that have IBS do help keep the patients uh, symptom free and so they recommend that that you should follow up with your patients of IBS even though you're not really not going to do much for them just seeing them in the office every six months improves uh, their symptoms now Again, laboratory findings. So CBC, you're looking for iron deficiency. Uh, fe fecal calprotectin is looking for IBD. There's other serologic testing that you can do for celiac and stool studies. Uh, and if all these are negative, and further testing really isn't necessary in most patients, right? Um, now, routine colonoscopy is not recommended in young patients. But again, if they have those alarm signs, we have to consider a further workup. Now, here's your alarm signs. Onset after age of 50, I would say 40 to 50, right? If you if this new, new onset IBS pops up, uh, we need to look into it further. If they have significant rectal bleeding or melanoma, that's not typical of IBS. Also noctur nocturnal diarrhea, progressive abdominal pain, unexplained weight loss, lab abnormalities, or a family history of IBD or colorectal cancer. These patients require additional evaluation, and that additional evaluation includes colonoscopy, generally speaking. Uh, what they do, especially in those with uh, diarrhea-based IBS, they go in with the colonoscopy and they take uh, biopsies at different portions of the colon, and that's looking for uh, microscopic colitis, colitis that can't be seen with the naked eye. Uh, to try to rule out, you know, IBD or other causes of recurrent diarrhea. So the treatment for IBS, most patients have chronic symptoms. And they vary in severity depending on if the patient's stressed or, you know, things like that. These patients tend to be, and I'm one of these patients, I do have IBS, so I can speak uh, for this. A lot of these patients, uh, ha their, their disease is tied a lot to emotion. Uh, so they tend to come in and, you know, ah, they're having these chronic complaints off and on. And so clinicians should really try to resist the temptation to, to chase down these chronic complaints over and over again. Um, once, the, once the IBS uh, diagnosis has been established. Really... A lot of what happens and the, the main reason why we want to see these patients every six months is that a lot of the intervention has to be uh, ha that ha takes place is reassurance, education and support for the patient. Uh, it's really important that these since it is a chronic condition, it doesn't go away. So it's good to have a, a strong clinician patient relationship in continuity of care. Uh, now, mild and intermittent symptoms that do not impair quality of life usually recommend lifestyle modifications and diet modifications, right? Uh, so this would be, you know, following a low FODMAP diet or um, increasing dietary fiber as well as maybe psyllium-based fibers, uh, things that are mild, trying just to, you know, oh, every time I eat fried foods, I have diarrhea. Okay, well, let's try to eliminate those foods from your diet and such. Now, mild to moderate symptoms who do not respond to initial management or patients with moderate to severe symptoms, then we start talking about pharmacological therapy. And this is adjunctive therapy. There is no cure for IBS. Uh, so some of the dietary modifications, I mean, you really have to pay attention to patterns. So uh, I can tell you for, my, for myself, for IBS, uh, there are certain places, certain restaurants, certain foods that will trigger uh, an episode of diarrhea. So if I go to Jason's Deli and I have salad bar, I can guarantee you within 30 minutes after eating that, that I will have problems. I will need a restroom. So uh, you can ask your patient, try to, to make a food log uh, to reveal patterns of symptoms related to certain foods. Um, a low FODMAP diet is recommended. Uh, I'll go into the FODMAP diet a little more uh, on, an, on a separate lecture. Uh, but essentially, it's limiting the, those foods that are hard to digest and hard to process, like uh, broccoli and beans and things like that. And there's a list. Uh, and I can maybe what I'll do is go ahead and post that on uh, 
on your blackboard so that you can take a look at it if you care to. Um, traditional IBS diets are regular meal patterns, avoiding large meals, large fatty meals, insoluble fibers, caffeine, and gas producing foods like beans, cabbage, and onions. Um, you might consider also doing lactose and gluten restriction. So especially if you notice a trend in the kind of the food log. So every time I eat ice cream, I get this, you know, you might also try to eliminate those foods at least temporarily and see if the symptoms resolve as well. And always we should limit alcohol and caffeine. Getting into some of the uh, adjunctive pharmacologic therapy, it should be based on the, the predominant symptom. It's usually a patient with IBS will have a predominant symptom, uh, being pain, constipation, and diarrhea. So for constipation-based uh, IBS, um, the first, first and foremost should be some sort of soluble fiber like psyllium. That's the first thing you should recommend. Honestly, by the time these patients have made it to your office, more than likely they have tried everything over the counter, including our, our go-to second line, which is Miralax. Uh, we you should definitely ask how they're using it though, because sometimes they're, they're not using it the way it should be, the way it's directed. So Miralax is gonna be your next go-to. And then there are some uh, even better therapies like Linzess and Ametiza. We use these every single day in the GI clinic. I mean, we gave out Linzess like candy and it works. I mean, it, it gets people going and they love you. They'll come back and they bring you a plate of cookies because they can go to the bathroom again. It works really, really well and it has a pretty safe profile. Um, IBSD, so the initial medication of choice is gonna be something like antidiarrheal, like loperamide or Imodium as initial treatment, but again, most of the time, by the time these patients have gotten to you, they've tried the over-the-counter stuff. Other things that can be used are bile acid sequestrants like Questran, and even um, the antispasmodics, which we're gonna cover in the pain, the, the Bentol and the Levsin can be used routinely to try to slow down the gut a bit and calm it down, and that can also be used for IBSD. Now, there is a newer medication out on the market and it's called uh, Vibersy, and it is, it's a life changer for those that can use it. I, I'm actually, uh, I actually use Vibersy, and it changed my life. It, it, it allows me to eat what, what I want when I want, and I, I pretty much symptom free, which is amazing. Now you can't use this medication in everyone. You have to really screen your patients. If you have any history of gallbladder or pancreas disease, including col cholecystectomy, so taking out the gallbladder, you cannot use this medication. So I know it, uh, with my GI doctor's office, I am the only, his only patient that is on this medication. And so they save the samples for me, which is nice. If the patient has predominant abdominal pain and bloating, the Typical medications we start with are antispasmodics, so like dicyclamine or bentol or levsin. And like I said, these can also be used for diarrhea-based, but taking them regularly, not as needed. And um, if the abdominal pain persists, there can be you can start patients on trials of TCAs or serotonin receptor antagonists, because remember there is some correlation between them. Now. Probiotics, I feel like they had this kind of phase where they were really popular, really common, like everybody was pro probiotics. Uh, but there is a pretty weak recommendation to use them for IBS and there's really no proven benefit. So we don't routinely prescribe them or recommend them for our patients. Uh, most patients with IBS can learn to cope with their symptoms and lead pretty productive lives. Um, so uh, it can be quite debilitating just because it doesn't have a, a quote-unquote organic cause, it doesn't mean that it can cannot be debilitating. It can be. Patients, uh, patients can be affected on a daily basis. Their daily lives can be affected by IBS. Um, I would I would say that a lot of the patients that have IBS, especially IBSD, I mean, they could tell you where every restroom is and every fast food restaurant, convenience store. 
the supermarket. I mean, they can tell you where the restroom is because they've at one point or another had to run to the restroom. So um, be patient with your patients. This is a chronic condition. It can be frustrating to treat these patients, but try to listen, be patient, and uh, don't go chasing things that aren't there, but at the same time, show your patients the respect to listen to them and try to help them as much as you can. This would be a good point to take a quick break. We have one more topic to cover. We have reached the 45 minute point. So take a quick break and then uh, come back at it for the last section. All right, so the last section we're going to be covering is ischemic bowel disease. Now, I want to make another point here. Ischemic bowel disease is not abbreviated IBD. IBD abbreviation is for inflammatory bowel disease, which are Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, which we will cover in the next lecture. So please, 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 please do not abbreviate this as IBD. So what is ischemic bowel disease? There are several different types of ischemic bowel disease. I'm sure you can tell from the word ischemic we're talking about lack of blood flow to the bowel. Now, if you think back to pull module, there was lack of blood flow to the lungs, which is a pulmonary embolism, right? If you think about heart attacks, that is a lack of blood flow to the heart, right? So the, the bowel, name the small bowel, large bowel, are fed by arteries, right? And they have drainage from veins, same as everywhere else in the body. So just like you can get ischemia in other places, you can get ischemia in the bowel itself. And there are several different causes of bowel ischemia. Uh, when we discuss this, we're talking mainly about the mesenteric vessels, the mesenteric arteries. So it's referred to more, more specifically as acute mesenteric ischemia. And when we talk about acute mesenteric ischemia, the most common cause of it is going to be an arterial embolism. So a clot that breaks off, usually because of cardiac issues such as AFib, an, M an MI or valvular disease, you get a clot, it breaks off, and it travels to the gut. And it blocks one of those arteries to a portion of the gut, and you get symptoms because of it. The key finding for acute mesenteric ischemia caused by an arterial embolism is going to be severe 
steady, diffuse abdominal pain with the absence of focal tenderness or distension. So it will be pain out of proportion to physical exam findings. That is the classic presentation for acute mesenteric ischemia. It's acute onset and the patient is just writhing in pain. They're 100 out of 10. And when you palpate their abdomen, it's it doesn't really reproduce the pain. It doesn't make it worse. The exam is pretty benign, but they have severe pain. That's the, the classic presentation. Uh, these patients tend to also have high white cell counts, lactic acidosis, hypotension, and abdominal distension. Uh, if you can imagine, if a part of the, the gut is not receiving blood, eventually anything that doesn't receive blood starts to necrose, starts to die. And once we have that, I mean, patients become very ill very quickly, septic with high lactic acid, high white cell counts, uh, peritoneal signs, and, and the like. Patients with uh, visceral arterial thrombosis, which we'll cover in a second, they tend to have a much more uh, chronic onset, uh, more historically consistent with chronic mesentery ischemia. So we'll talk about that shortly. Now, we just talked about an arterial embolism. You can also have a venous thrombosis uh, that can cause ischemia of the bowel. It tends to present similarly to the arterial embolism, but a little less pronounced. So it can, instead of acute, acute, it's like, you know, a few hours to days. And we look for these in patients with predisposing factors such as hypercoagulable states, oral contraceptives, portal hypertension, etc. Now, chronic mesenteric ischemia, we generally think of as, I think of it as uh, intestinal angina. So if you think about angina of the heart, it's this thrombus, this plaque that's formed on the, the coronary arteries, right? And as you use them more, it starts to hurt, right? You start getting chest pain as you start exerting yourself. So what is exertion of the bowels? It's not running, right? It's not, you know, doing exercise. It's eating, right? And when we eat, that's when blood is shunted to our gut. And if we have this area that's partially blocked off from plaque formation from atherosclerotic disease, we get angina of the gut. So these patients over time, because it's usually a chronic process, and they usually have pre-existing atherosclerotic disease like, uh, you know, a CAD, a pre previous stroke or, or coronary artery disease, right? They, they have what's called intestinal angina. So every time these patients eat, they tend to get this uh, epigastric periumbilical postprandial pain, and it can last anywhere from one to three hours. It, it can be quite painful for these patients. So most of them, to avoid the pain, they limit food. They really don't eat too much because it hurts so bad afterwards. They pay for it. And they might even develop this phobia of eating, and they tend to lose weight because of it. Now, arterial thrombosis can also become acute mesenteric ischemia. We say it usually chronic because these patients kind of develop this plaque over time, but just like plaque formation in the heart can become unstable, throw the thrombus, and cause an acute MI, the same thing can happen in ischemic bowel disease. You can have a thrombosis, uh, a plaque or atherosclerotic disease that can acutely thrombose and block off that vessel. Then we have the same picture as the arterial embolism, which is more acute onset of pain out of proportion and things like that. Last but not least, we have this third kind of category called ischemic colitis. Now, this is non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia, meaning that it's not because one of the vessels is blocked. The best way I can explain this to you is it's, it tends to happen because of vasoconstriction, because of low cardiac output because the blood's being sent other places. So think about patients that are critically ill, uh, elderly patients, uh, patients that have you know trauma or things like that that are in the ICU. They get shunted to give the blood to other places. So if we're not digesting, right, if we have our sympathetic system going, we are not sending blood to our gut. And so if you think about it, it's kind of the last place to get the blood. And especially with low cardiac output, so you get these areas of the of the colon, uh, 
called watershed areas that have limited collateralization. And that more most often is going to be the splenic flexure. So up in the, the left upper side of the colon, uh, they tend, they don't get enough blood. And so the, the bowel starts to kind of die and it gets this rectal discharge, mucusy discharge, cramping, diarrhea. Uh, and that's, that's ischemic colitis. It's non-occlusive, remember. So think about it. We have all these different causes they present sort of similarly, at least the acute ones do. So you have to really carefully review the patient's history, their family history, history of prior embolic events, um, AFib, uh, atherosclerotic disease, pulmonary embolism. You have to ask these things, right, uh, to be able to help you diagnose this. I also want to talk about postprandial pain or chronic illness to see if it could be a, a thrombosis as well. So going over it again, classic presentations of acute mesenteric ischemia, regardless of the cause, are going to be severe abdominal pain disproportionate to physical exam findings. And they love to test on this. This is how they present in vignettes as well. Um, you essentially get infarction to the intestines, right? So I think of it as an, an MI of the gut, right? Um, these patients also have anorexia, vomiting, GI, it can be GI bleeding as well. Peritonitis, sepsis, and shock are late stages when the bowel is dying off. And uh, it can lead to shock and death. So the abdominal exam, maybe just a little bit of distension, maybe just a little bit of inflammation, but it's not even close to how the patient is writhing in pain. Sometimes you can have some blood in the stool. And occasionally they can have this feculent odor to their breath. They, if it has progressed, progressed enough, they start getting dehydration, shock, and deterioration. Now, there are some subtle differences between the presentations of the different etiologies of mesenteric ischemia. Remember we said embolic, especially arth arterial embolic disease, symptoms are sudden, painful, uh, and acute. Arterial thrombosis, they tend to have uh, this chronic disease, and all of a sudden, bam, they get uh, like the heart attack kind of picture. Uh, but it tends to have more of a gradual, less severe course than the embolic disease. We said non-occlusive ischemia is going to be generally in critically ill patients. And then the venous thrombosis is going to be several days, weeks, gradual worsening in a patient with a history of hypercoagulable state for some reason. Now, there is a, a nice algorithm that's from up to date as to how to diagnose and initially manage intestinal ischemia. I'll tell you this, it can fall through the cracks, this diagnosis, because you're thinking about all the surgical causes, you know, appendicitis, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, diverticulitis, and you forget about mesenteric ischemia. You forget about it. Uh, I t tend to forget about this in a AAA, but you cannot forget about this because patients can get very, very ill and die on you. So it always has to be on your differential, especially in the elderly population. So, and, and especially in those patients that have histories of embolisms and thrombosis, and disease, um, tell your radiologist, I mean, if you have a high suspicion for this, tell your radiologist that's what you're looking for when you're ordering your imaging studies. So let's look at this quickly. Let me get a pen out. So the first thing we're looking for is we're getting a history, symptoms, pain out of proportion on physical exam. And then we have to assess the patient's stability, right? Are they hemodynamically stable? You know, how is their pulse? What is their respiration rate like? How, what does their blood pressure look like? They have high fever. Uh, do they have signs of sepsis, right? If they do, then we need to address their resuscitation efforts first. We need to give them lots of IV therapy, empiric antibiotic use, and even consider anticoagulation depending on the patient. It, it won't benefit them if they have the non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia, but that can be addressed later on. 
after the resuscitation efforts, because they're fragile, right, you can get some uh, bedside plain film abdominals. And what you're really looking for is signs of free air, advanced ischemia, like dead bowel. You're looking for just quick assessment. Is there free air under the diaphragm? And if it's no, then you can move on to the CT after they've improved and they're hemodynamically stable. If they continue, if, they, if you find free air, if you find advanced disease, you move right on to the laparotomy. You go quickly to surgery uh, because these patients are, especially if they are hemodynamically unstable, these patients are critical. Okay. Now, if they are not hemodynamically unstable, if they are stable, the, uh, the test of choice is going to be an abdominal CT with IV contrast. That is what we do initially to look for signs of this, okay? Um, the, the IV contrast is also placed in the arterial system, kind of like a CTA, like the kind of CTA we do for the lungs, except for in the gut area. And we, with that t test, we are able to, um, able to find whether we have this non-occlusive ischemia, embolic thrombosis, mesenteric venous thrombosis, we can see those things on abdominal CT. Now, if the abdominal CT is non-diagnostic, but you still have a high suspicion, then we move on to what is quote unquote the gold standard for diagnosis of intestinal ischemia. It's a mesenteric arteriogram. And this is a procedure similar to like a catheterization, right? Where you go in with catheter and you inject dye into the mesenteric arteri ar arterial system and venous system, and that is uh, looking for evidence of a blocked, a blocked artery or vein. And so this is a, definitely a more invasive procedure. And according to this algorithm, the CT definitely comes first, and the arteriogram comes second in a hemodynamically stable patient. And that is if it's needed. Okay. So that's pretty, there's a lot going on here. It's really pretty simple. You first, you assess whether they're hemodynamically stable or not. If they're stable, you do CT. If the CT shows you what you have, then great. You treat it as needed. There are also algorithms for each of these different ones, which we won't go into. It's a little too much. But as far as treatment, there's different you know, protocols for each different kind. Uh, in addition to those imaging studies, we want to consider laboratory studies. We'll get the same kind of abdominal stuff plus some, some markers like serum lactate to look for um, sepsis. Get a CBC. We usually see marked leukocytosis. We get CMP, amylase lipase. And then a lot of these patients get ABGs, and that's because metabolic acidosis happens very commonly uh, along with ischemia of the bowel. We certainly wouldn't delay care for this, but a lot of times we'll add it on to the laboratories we're doing. Um, if a patient has acute abdominal pain and metabolic acidosis, they you should think in your head that they have in some sort of intestinal ischemia until proven otherwise. Now, we said that this abdominal CT with IV contrast is uh, the first line screening. It's the test that we do most often for screening purposes. What we're looking for are these findings here. So thickened bowel walls. The walls are kind of thicker than they usually are. You can also see uh, sometimes this uh, pneumatosis. So you get air within the bowel wall. Those are findings uh, consistent with uh, ischemia of the bowel. Uh, an alternative to the CTA would be an MRA, uh, which is uh, more expensive and less readily available, but it isn't a viable alternative. And then we said that the mesenteric angiography is considered the gold standard. However, it's not always necessary to make the diagnosis, but it is a definitive diagnostic test. And then we do abdominal radiographs usually early on in our evaluation. Uh, and they, they can be normal in up to 25% of patients with ischemic bowel disease, but they help us quickly establish signs of perforation or alternative diagnoses like small bowel obstructions. And this is, this is something that happens much more rapidly than a CT. So that's why we do it. And it, it does have a place in the algorithm when the patient is hemodynamically unstable.
So how do we treat patients? So I'm going to go over treatment. I'm going to talk about kind of generalized treatment and keep in mind that depending on the etiology of the ischemic bowel disease, each one kind of has its own algorithm for approach to treatment, which I'm not going to go into. It's a little too, too much detail. You should definitely know the general approach. Okay. So first and foremost, we need to assess for patient stability. We need to give them IV fluid resuscitation, broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, if they need an NG tube, we put it. We have to monitor these patients because they have uh, they have blockage of the gut, so they can become hemodynamically unstable quite quickly. And we should also correct electrolyte abnormalities. We should give pain control judiciously. These patients come in with a lot, a lot of pain. So we can give them opioids, uh, parenternal. Uh, there are here a couple of different more specialized techniques. I don't expect you to know this, but you can do a direct infusion of one of a couple different things, one of vasodilator or thrombolytics if needed uh, in patients with uh, acute mesenteric ischemia. This is more on this, the surgery end once you know what you have and you can treat it. Um, sometimes uh, patients are given heparin anticoagulation, especially for venous thrombosis. Uh, you can consider it in all kinds, uh, unless the patient has active bleeding. Remember that some of these patients, because of the ischemia, can develop some bleeding. So you definitely want to assess uh, whether or not they're bleeding before you start administering uh, blood, uh, blood thinners. And remember that if the patient has high fever and you're worried about, about there being um, non-viable bowel present, remember if it's lost blood for enough time, it's, it's died off. You can't leave that dead bowel inside. And so surgery has to be considered in, in those, especially with signs of peritonitis. And then you want to avoid vasopressors. So remember, a lot of these patients become unstable. They get, they, their blood pressures start bottoming out and you want to put them on pressors. But you have to consider that that vasopressors are going to cause increased ischemia because they're going to clamp down the vessels and that can worsen the ischemia so you have to be careful when doing that so we talked briefly about chronic mesenteric ischemia we said it's usually caused by atherosclerotic disease these patients have a more chronic um, chronic findings, so a postprandial uh, abdominal angina that we talked about, and they usually have weight loss and phobia of eating. Now, in these cases, uh, they tend to get a mesenteric arteriography to confirm, and then they have surgical revascularization if they're able to tolerate it. Similar to like a, a catheterization for the heart, right? Or a, a cabbage for the heart. So, it depends the prognosis depends on the mechanism it's worse for patients with the uh, arterial etiology compared to vetus and for acute mesenteric ischemia the mortality rates can exceed 60 percent that is because we have it's hard to diagnose in some cases and we have dead bowel right that the clock is ticking on our bowel when we're losing blood supply to it uh, the mortality rate uh, on one systemic review was about 47 percent uh, patients who survive an acute event are likely to die of complications related to the condition that predispose them to the intestinal ischemia. So keep that in mind. Here's some images of what we're talking about. So you can see you have uh, a clot that breaks off, travels down the aorta, and lodges itself into the uh, mesenteric arteries. And we get the blockage. Uh, blood supply doesn't go to those areas. You do have some collateral circulation, especially in the chronic mesenteric ischemia. You get kind of neovascularization where you get new roots that, that form. But in the acute blockage, you don't have time for that. And so you have these areas of the intestine that are blocked off and they become necrotic. And they, this is all area of bowel that's going to need to be resected. It's just dead. Here's another. This one was a venous ischemia. This was a venous thrombosis. Uh, so they, they um, thrombosis in here. I think it's these. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, they had to go in and remove that and then, of course, remove this dead, dead bowel. 
and that is it. We made it through our lecture. And uh, this was, again, the first of two lectures that we will do on the colon. And uh, I hope it was interesting and that we learned a lot. And keep your mind open because there are more things to come when it comes to the colon. Thank you for your attention, and I will see you next time.